Welcome to the blah, 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 blah episode of the Revo Convo. This is one of your hosts, Drew Odom, and your other host, Laura Lavoie. Yes, 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 we are your hosts. And uh, like I said, this is the umpteenth uh, uh, recording, uh, our, our show of the Revo Convo. Um, as I always say, but I'm even more aware of it now, Laura, because I was listening to some podcasts this weekend, catching up on some. I'm seriously in awe of those people that have those like really smooth radio sounding voices. And it's like <laughs> podcasting comes so natural to them. It's like they're really on the air live and stuff. And I'm like, I sound like a bumbling idiot half the time. How do they do it? I think you're wrong. I think you sound great. Oh, well, thanks. Thanks. Laura thinks I sound great. So clearly there's a business or a sponsorship out there that thinks I sound great. Feel free to email me, business or sponsorship. <laughs> there, I fit it in. I, I'm done with that rant for the week. Excellent. So, uh, Laura, today's a big day for, well, this week is a big week for me. I'm going to tell you why. You ready why? I'm ready. It's a big week because Tiny Revolution is pleased to announce that it is launching its first ebook entitled How to Decorate the Tiny House. Um, it is on sale for $4.95. It's available on our website, tinyrevolution.us, as well as on a couple of affiliate sites. Uh, it's a 48 page guide. Uh, on how to decorate the tiny house. And I think we can have talked about this before, but I think we can all agree that many people don't think about what the inside of their tiny house is going to look like, reflect, or make them feel like um, until it's almost too late. Um, they don't think about kind of the textures, the colors, the styles, that sort of stuff. And then they end up with basically uh, the interior not being what makes them feel really at home. And so they're stuck living in a house and not a home. And so in our 48-page ebook, book uh, we're hoping to help folks with that and help them do it from a planning stage rather than an afterthought. Absolutely. So what and do you I think about that? Right You've read the book. You've actually read you're, – you're one of the people that's read the book. What did you think about it? Be honest. I can take it. <laughs> I will be honest. I think it is a fantastic resource. There are so many books and e-books and things available for people – you know, to learn how to build a tiny house, mm -hmm. but you're right. This is, you know, there's nothing out there resource wise for how to decorate the tiny house or why you want to care about decorating the tiny house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and your book really gives people a lot of information to think about, you know, about colors and textures and, and the use of space and, and things that will really make that you know, take your tiny house to the next level. Yeah, and I mean, we even covered things like, you know, the psychological effects of colors, the physiological effects of colors. Uh, we talk, we talk uh, at great length about having furniture that serves double duty. Um, one of the things I'm most proud of is we have some guest decorators who chime in uh, at different points during the book. Um, one of those being Melissa Tack of the Tiny Tack House and then Deke Diedrichson of Relax Shacks. Um, so it kind of lends this, this different approach to it, which I'm very pleased with. Um, and you know, the book kind of came out of the two hour workshop that I taught on how to decorate, but it's so much more than that. I mean, I think it's really, it has expanded to a level that I didn't think it would. And I'm really proud of the book. So I would encourage you all head over to tinyrevolution.us on the right sidebar. You'll see a button that uh, will allow you to purchase it. Again, it's $4 and 95 cents. It's instant download. Uh, so you'll have that available to you, and I think about three minutes after you purchase it. So please help support your friends and family at Tiny Revolution, as well as find out more about how to decorate your tiny house. So there you have it. There's my big announcement. There you do have it. That's pretty awesome. That's a great announcement. Yeah. And hey, you. Um, 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 I saw on your Facebook that you are almost ready to wrap up your entry into the literary world. I am. I have been working on an ebook for uh, way longer than it should have taken. Uh, I had hoped to have it out in the spring. Obviously, that didn't happen. Uh, but it is so close. It is so close I can taste it. I am hoping that it will be available uh, by the end of the month. And it is an ebook titled uh, 120 Ideas for Tiny Living, which, as you might imagine, is kind of my theme. And uh, it'll be available on Kindle. And so you can even, if you really, really want to have a paperback book in your hand, you can buy one through Amazon. Wow. That's a lot of options. That's a lot of options. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm going to say, I'm going to put myself out there and say that once this book comes out, we'll probably be giving away an autographed copy of it to 
somebody. Oof, that is very exciting. I um, I kind of want to win it, but I don't need to because I already wrote it. Yeah, pretty much you you sign your name on things all the time, so it would, t- it would take away the magic of it for you, I think. <laughs> true i think um yeah so um so anything uh anything else going on i mean we've talked a lot about workshops lately i I, i'm anxious to hear some follow-up on some of them um you know that sort of thing um i i don't have a lot to report i don't know if i told you this but uh last weekend i was fortunate enough to have my dad pop in for a day and a night and uh he helped me put up a couple of storage shelves in my tiny office as well as some uh, some insulation and some sheetrock, so uh, oh. it's the temperature is considerably more manageable in here, and uh, <laughs> I have some things stored instead of just uh, kind of lounging around, which is nice. Um, it, I'm really proud of how this thing turned out, and to be perfectly honest with you, anyone that's listening to this show, um, you know, this is an eight by twelve building. And save the fact that in one corner is, you know, my, my office, because I work from it every day, all day. Um, so, you know, it's not that I really needed him to stop by, but when you're trying to install an eight-foot-long uh, shelf, it's really nice to have that second set of hands. So, so yeah, yeah that's, that, that's about all happening in my world over here. Excellent. It sounds fabulous. Yeah. So what have you been up to? How's the, you stayed the weekend, this past weekend, in the... In the, the tiny house, because you're going back and forth between the city and the country, but you stayed this weekend, didn't you? Oh, we did. We did. It was absolutely beautiful. It was a gorgeous fall weekend, and we got outside, and we built a campfire, and we made some s'mores, and it was absolutely gorgeous. Awesome. Awesome. Well, that sounds great. Well, look, I don't want to eat into too much time. I know I've talked a lot because uh, I just did, because that's what I do. Um, but I want to bring on our guest today. So, yeah, why don't you introduce our guest today? Tell us who we're who we're talking to today. Sure, we have the pleasure of talking to our very good friend Ryan Mitchell. Um, he is the author of the ebook "Cracking the Code," and we want to talk to him a little bit about tiny house code. Awesome! So let's give him a ringy ding ding and see if we can get him on the line. Here we go. Ryan Mitchell, are you there, my friend? I am, sir. How are you? Doing well. Doing well. Hey, Laura, ever notice how the guests ask me how I am and never ask how you are? I guess they just assume you're always good. <laughs> I am always, always great. Good. I, am, I am always great. That's good. That's good to hear. Um, yeah, so we have Ryan Mitchell on the call today. And I know for those of you who have uh, been, sub- you know, have been subscribers to the show for some time, you know that we've interviewed Ryan before. But uh, Ryan is just, uh, he's digging himself deeper and deeper into this tiny house hole. And uh, by that, I mean he's becoming more and more involved with a lot of different things. So we're excited about that. We're going to talk about some of that stuff today. But Laura really wanted to, she was pushing for this interview to be quite frank. I mean, I was like, do we really want to talk to him again? And she kept saying, no, we should, we should. um, I I think the reason why is because... uh, over we we all are overwhelmed at times by the amount of emails and and online questions and stuff regarding uh, codes and ordinances and regulations and that sort of stuff. And uh, yeah. Ryan Ryan's kind of a, a resident expert about that, having written his own book called uh, Cracking the Code, uh, which has sold extremely well. I would think. Um, I know that mm-hmm. uh, quite a few copies have sold off of my website, and I think I've even given a copy or two away. So. I know it's it's done well for you, Ryan, and I think that's what we want to talk about today, most specifically, is this idea of codes, because um, uh, as I have dabbled a little bit with the Tiny House Alliance that's forming up, and then with some other groups and stuff, uh, what we're, we're coming to this interesting kind of uh, crossroads, and, and I'll let you talk more about this, but uh, come into kind of this interesting crossroads where a lot of us are starting to feel like some building codes and regulations aren't necessarily a bad thing uh, for tiny houses because we're starting to see a number of what I will call um, scary homes for people to live in because they're they're comprised of of little more than um, than than a lot of wishful thinking and some some blog posts Uh, so what do you think about that Ryan do you think we're seeing we're seeing a lot more people taking to building their own home and and maybe don't 
quite have the skill set to be doing such? Yeah, I think, um, you know, with the tiny house movement just growing as it has, uh, we're just seeing more and more builders. And I think with any growth, you're going to have some growing pains. And so we have a unique kind of challenge or opportunity, however you want to see it, uh, that um, we as bloggers and, and builders and things like that, um, we have to come up with a solution to effectively take a person who's never built anything in their lives to being a competent home builder. Uh, typically in about a year's time is, is about how long it takes for people to build uh, a tiny house when they're doing it themselves for the first time. So we're in this weird, unique position of having to train people across the United States on how to safely build a tiny home, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a particularly um, large task to, to tackle. And, uh, you know, to your point about the discussions kind of shifted a little bit to maybe some building codes or whatever we want to call them uh, would be a good idea. And I, I think that's exactly right. We we're starting to see, um, you know, some of these novice builders, which we've all been there, we, everyone started somewhere, um, and we all make mistakes. Uh, but, you know, there's certain mistakes that um, cause a lot of concern when, you know, people like us kind of see photos of people's builds and things like that. Uh, and, and they're, you know, honest mistakes, um, but they can have really dire consequences, um, maybe even fatal uh, so we we need to figure out a way to keep people safe, to train people uh, in how to build a home when they're not a, a professional builder, and then uh, you know just help the, the the community as a whole grow in their knowledge and skill sets. Mm -hmm. Now you've written you've written a book called Cracking the Code, which Laura, you've read the book, haven't you? I have. In fact, I have my copy right in front of me. Oh my gosh, you're that student. Oh. My. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so we've read the book, and uh, Brian, I think what's interesting is, you know, people try and think, okay, well, well, what good does this book do me? You know, we don't have to, we fall in that loophole of, you know, not really needing to be inspected, that sort of thing. Would you say, in your opinion, and, and Laura, also in yours, would you say, in your opinion, understanding the building code for a traditional sticks and bricks is a really good place to start your uh, your construction kind of research and background, knowing what's required of, of, of larger houses so that you can apply those same kind of principles to a smaller house. Are you there? Was that, yeah, was, oh, I thought that was a question for Laura. No, it was a question for both of you. I, I, hey, Look, guys. Anyone listening to this podcast, you'll know that I didn't. I didn't uh, say anything because I'm so used to the phone cutting out, and my computer shutting down, and all sorts of weird things. So I just thought, oh, great, I lost them again. But uh, <laughs> yeah, that was that was kind of a question. I mean, don't y'all? Wouldn't you think that understanding kind of the building code for larger structures might be a great place, a, a great jumping off point for starting to plan building your own tiny house? I mean. All of those regulations at one point or another, whether we want to believe it, were put in place for a reason, whether it's for sanitation reasons or health reasons or structural reasons or, you know, there's a host of different reasons. But uh, I, I, I personally think it's a good jumping off point to understand the code for larger structures and then apply. Yeah, it's, um, you know, the, the building code... And there's a lot of villainizing of building codes. And I, I completely admit that there's a lot of times that they're really frustrating for even me. Uh, but, you know, building codes, um, most of them at least, are there for a reason. And I, I talk a little bit about this in the ebook about how building codes came about and why. Uh, you know, there was a time in our country where housing uh, was just exploding, but there was no regulation. And it meant that people were burning to death in their homes. It meant, you know, squalor. It meant sanitation issues, um, which led to, you know, large spread diseases and things like that. So, uh, you know, the building codes, they are a barrier to tiny houses, but they've also brought um, a, a quality of life and, and uh, prosperity and, and health 
um, and safety to our our country um, as a whole that uh, most people don't even understand or appreciate. So they're really important, and I think uh, I, I always try to encourage people to say, you know, even if you're not going to get inspected, uh, try to build it as close to building code as you can, um, just because uh, there may come a day where you want to go legal, or there may be a day where you have to, uh, you know, kind of defend your house when uh, building codes and zoning discovers it, uh, things like that. And so just knowing the issues and building your house the best you can will will help in all those situations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I mean, go ahead, Laura. I'm sorry. Well, and it, it does, like you say, it gives people kind of a, an understanding about how to go about building an actual house uh, as opposed to building a shed or, you know, a kid's fort or something like that. You know, when you're living in this house, to be completely habitable, safe, and, you know, f- everything else, it needs to be built to the same standards as, you know, a larger home. It just happens to be very, very tiny. Yeah. Um, you know, to, to kind of chime in, when, when I taught the, uh, both terms of the, um, of the small home big life course and we got into kind of framing, I was surprised at how many people were not aware of the difference between a wall stud and a king stud or people who had, you know, never before heard of a cripple or anything like that because those are – you know, to my opinion, pretty elementary things in terms of framing. I mean, there's, you know, when you put a header over a door, there's a reason why. I mean, there, there's a reason for all of this stuff. And even for measurements, you know, the difference between 16 inch on center and 20 inch on center and 24 inch on, on center, you know, there is a reason for all of that. And, and I really think that it could, you know, I think it could benefit people to understand the, the the code and the legalities on the larger scale to apply them to the smaller scale. Um, Ryan, in your book, Cracking the Code, what do you really, what do you feel like the book really says? I mean, do you feel like you, you pull together some codes and you kind of tell us how to, how to understand these codes? Or do you feel like it's a, a kind of a guide to municipalities thinking? Or what is it that prompted you to write the book in the first place? I mean, what started um, me down this road was just my personal experience of trying to navigate building codes and zoning uh, in my own home uh, with my own tiny house. And uh, I live in a particularly uh, conservative uh, area in terms of building codes just because of the growth that my city is seeing, which I live in Charlotte. Um, You know, currently there's... 40,000 people moving to Charlotte a year, and that's in a slump. You know, we're still in the slump, the housing market slump. So uh, you can just imagine what kind of volume that this, these people are having to deal with uh, when it comes to, you know, boom time. And, and, and so, uh, you know, just understanding the issue, the main thrust of the book is that I want you to understand some of the main issues with tiny houses, why they aren't legal. Uh, I want you to understand um, some of the key terms and concepts and then just be aware of of these issues so that you can have an informed conversation uh, with your local building codes and zoning folks uh, or make the decision, uh, an informed decision on deciding to go under the radar. Uh, whatever you choose, that's up to you. Um, but I talk about how you can do both in the book. And, you know, the, the trick, so the, uh, I've had a few people come to me like, I really want some really specific things. Uh, and the, the truth is that um, in America, there's over 3,000 counties. And I have a, a good, more and more, I get emails from Canadians, and there's over 500 counties in Canada. So there's no way, I, physically, I mean, there was just no way uh, – that you could write uh, a really in-depth book on uh, every single code for every single county uh, because the, the amount that they changed, the second that I push out a book, um, they would, uh, it would be out of date. So what I, I, I realized was a better approach was to give you guys the concepts uh, to understand it. And, and I think that's the more important part is you, you gain the understanding and it doesn't matter what county you're in. Uh, what 
state or country even you are in, um, you're understanding the core principles of, of the building codes and how they relate to tiny houses. Uh, and it, it points you in the right direction and informs you enough to have uh, productive conversations with your local code enforcement. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and, it, and that's where this book has really become a resource for me for other people because I get emails all the time about, you know, I live in X county in X state. What are the codes where I live? And, yeah. of course, I don't know the answer to that. So I send them your book and tell them to talk to their local authorities because that's really the only answer you can get. Yeah, I like your use of the word authorities there. That's interesting. Your local authorities. Um, please do call your Bureau of Investigation and find out from them <laughs> what will keep you out of serving prison time. Um, no, I, I completely agree. I mean, it, it's absurd, Ryan, to think that anyone could possibly have a comprehensive book on every municipality, every code, every this, every that, because, and they are constantly changing. I mean, almost every time a, a city council meets, the code changes in some minute way. Um, I think the larger issue here, and I'd love to hear from you on this as well, the larger issue, of course, is are municipalities even moving towards the realm of, of accepting smaller structures? Um, and I say that because it's very timely we're having this conversation. My parents, um, who I've talked about many times on this show, um, which hope, I guess they've never heard the show because otherwise they would probably tell me to stop talking about them. Um, but, uh, you know, my parents retired into a 4,800 square foot home for the two of them because clearly everyone needs their own private 2,400 square feet. Um, <laughs> so, you know, they moved in, they, they had this home built uh, and they moved into it. And it's a beautiful home. Don't get me wrong. I mean... You know, Tara, in, or Tara, or however you want to pronounce it, in Gone with the Wind, is a beautiful home, but it's huge. Um, so my parents have this beautiful home. Um, I've often tried at Christmas time to sell tickets because they put a tree in every room. I think we could make some loot there. But um, they have decided since to, as they're getting older, that they don't want to keep up with it. They don't want to maintain the grounds. They don't, look, You like how I say grounds instead of yard. They don't want to maintain the grounds. They don't want to, you know, continue having to clean every nook and cranny all the time, um, which really is just an exercise in walking in circles because you start cleaning, and then by the time you finish the house, it's time to start again. So it's really just one big circle. Um, so they're downsizing. They've decided they want to downsize. They want to build a little 1,100-square-foot house, which I think is beautiful. So this past week, they were kind of traveling around the southeast region, and they found some land they were interested in, and they called the real estate agent. And I guess y'all know where I'm going with this story. They wanted to purchase four acres, so they asked about the prices and all this, and then come to find out, as the conversation continued, this particular developer said, well, I can't just sell you the land because there is some contractual obligations. Uh, we only allow, we're only allowing a minimum of 2,400 square foot homes. Uh, you can only have one outbuilding. You must be connected to city sewage and city water, um, which will come at significant expense because we are 22 minutes outside of the city. I mean, all of these ridiculous things. And um, so it's very timely because here are my parents who are uh, in their mid-60s are looking to downsize to something that's a little more affordable and something that they feel they can keep up with, maintain. And they're being told that they can't build that size, that that's too small for, for building. Um, so Ryan, do you think, you know, having been part of the conversations you've been part of, do you think that municipalities are even close to starting to recognize smaller structures? Yeah, I, I think, um, and you, you actually kind of hit on the big issue is, um, how are we going to handle, um, an aging, uh, generation of, that we call the baby boomers? Uh, and I think this is actually one of the bigger opportunities for tiny houses. Is, is the fact that um, not only uh, is it a good uh, avenue for us to pursue in terms of legalities of tiny houses, but it's also um, one of our largest uh, demographics in terms of people that are attracted to tiny houses. Uh, so th there's kind of a, a double-edged uh, sword there in terms of opportunity because we can, um, you know, capitalize, and I don't, 
not to say capitalize. That's kind of a, a bad word, but uh, you know, we, we can, uh, <laughs> um, you know, we can certainly benefit from our, you know, society trying to figure out how they're going to house and deal with, uh, you know, the rising cost of medical uh, cost and. Um, you know, people not wanting to live in retirement homes and things like that. You know, uh, you talk with most baby boomers, they, and they they they've seen their parents go through retirement homes, and they're scared to death of living in a retirement home. They don't want to do it, and uh, you know, so they have these retirement communities, the assisted living communities. Um, but you know, uh, the thing is that. Um, you know, developers are scrambling to build these things as fast as they can, and there's going to be a lot of money in it, but they're never going to be able to achieve um, enough housing for all the baby boomers. Mm-hmm. It's just it's just physically impossible with the capacity of the United States. And so it's going to leave a lot of people in a tough spot because they, even if they have the money, they won't be able to find it because the housing options will be so scarce for baby boomers. And uh, it's also really expensive. My grandparents were just looking at it like last month and the buy-in for one of these places was 120 grand plus 6,000 a month. Um, Yeah. So, I mean, you know, and that 120 grand was just money that is gone. It's not like you get it back afterwards or anything like that. So, um, you know, these options are really expensive and frankly not a viable option for most people. Um, and I think Tiny Houses has a great opportunity to mm-hmm. offer an affordable solution uh, that's flexible so that people can live out their lives <clears throat> on their own land. And when it comes time that they need more help or it comes time uh, where they want to be closer to family, see their grandchildren, whatever it is, uh, that they can. Uh, you know, do so because they just hook up their house and wheel it to their their ch- children's backyards. So, from a legality standpoint, I think there's going to be a lot of movement uh, because of this dynamic that people are looking for um, in housing options. Mm-hmm. And I, I think we're going to start to see um, a lot of options for um, accessory dwelling units. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're not quite there yet. And a lot of cities are really hesitant to adopt accessory dwelling units at this point. Uh, And um, even once they do, it's still quite a a long stretch between an accessory dwelling unit and a uh, actual tiny house. There's a lot of barriers there. And I I think it's, I think you're, you're getting closer there. Um, but I, I think it's also important to understand that um, building codes are really, unfortunately, uh, inflexible. Uh, you know, I was talking with Macy Miller over Mini Motives at one point about just the, the process of the how the international building code is developed and what when you start to really get into the the details and the weeds of the thing, you realize that. If you were to propose a code to the International Building Code, and let's say everyone was on board with it from day one, you still wouldn't see adoption in your hometown for probably another 15 years. Right. It, yeah. It's that that slow of a process. Yeah, I think the key is that cities are really going to have to hone in and look at their pre-existing or their rather their existing codes for things like mobile homes modular homes rvs that sort of stuff and figure out how smaller dwellings can fit into those you know those existing codes already i think that's going to be a major issue is um how can we take what we already have those parameters and wrap them around a new structure of building um you know here in rural north carolina that's one of the things that we were able to kind of used to our advantage is that because we are built on a trailer, we were able to fall into some some manufactured quasi modular sort of you know zoning so to speak or, or some regulations. Not everything was a, a, a perfect fit, but some things did work out pretty well. And it's going to also require and correct me if I'm wrong, it's going to require municipalities to really want to serve their communities in this capacity. 
if there's no interest, let, let's say, for instance, a municipality says, you know what, we have such a high tax you know, revenue right now, we need to maintain that in order to pay for city services. We simply can't you know, commit to having you know, 100 tiny houses whose annual tax bill is $27. We just can't do it. You know, we've got to have these size houses. To me, the irony of that is I would rather have 100 tiny houses paying $27 a year than I had zero houses, you know, zero new houses um, paying, you know, whatever, four or $500 a year. And I think that's the point we're getting to is that people are looking for smaller spaces. They're not finding it. So they're actually looking at alternative lifestyles, uh, whether it be nomadic lifestyles or condo living or apartment living or something like that, um, where they don't pay, you know, don't pay uh, property taxes on those to begin with. And I think cities are losing out on what could be a very big market. And this is not even to speak to the amount of college graduates and young professionals that simply cannot get mortgage funding for a $150,000 home, which, let's face it, a good part of America, a quote-unquote starter home, can't hardly be found for less than 100000 any longer. And, and to your point here, there's, uh, you know, the key... The areas, the municipalities that have successfully uh, integrated, I guess, tiny houses into their, you know, their cities are ones that are using existing codes and, you know, mobile home codes and things like that to work around the concept of what that home is. It's not so much a house as it is a vehicle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I get concerned, Ryan, for two reasons. I, I want... I want municipalities to be a little more open-minded, but at the same time, I don't want them to be so open-minded that, that the safety of tiny home builders and small home builders is, is you know, put at stake. Um, I want there to be, I, I, I am a firm believer, I would like for there to be some regulations. You know, I live in a tiny house that we constructed, and I'm completely secure in how sound it is, only because our experiences with sticks and bricks building. So we built it just like we would build a house on a foundation. It just happens to be on a trailer. But I have seen lately several things that really concern me. Number one, they can, well, they concern me for two reasons. One, when they're parked and two, when they're in transit. I mean, that's as big of an issue as anything else is, is are these things securely you know, uh, securely enough fastened to their trailer that they're not going to be a safety hazard when out on the highway. Yeah, it's, um, you, you look around and, and there's a lot of um, examples, unfortunately, of, of things that uh, just need to be addressed. Um, you know, everything from how to attach the house to the trailer um, to the, you know, and a, uh, I'm a big proponent on this, and I know there's a lot of people that disagree with me on it, um, but a new trailer. Uh, I, I see people reclaiming trailers from old RVs, from boats, I mean, you name it. Um, and I'm not saying you can't do that, um, but yeah, all, most of the examples I've seen just left me with a sense of worry, uh, just because they looked really unstable, uh, they were really compromised in terms of rust and things like that. And, uh, well, it, people... it, Ryan, it comes down to, and, and I'm talking from a person who has a reclaimed trailer, it comes down to really having balls of steel when you get a, uh, a reclaimed trailer. I mean, you have to, <laughs> you have to think of it as I, am I truly willing to put my life and my family's life at, you know, at the risk of this trailer? Is it in that good of condition? The only reason I think we were comfortable with our reclaimed trailer was, number one, the weight that it was rated for, which we did ample homework on prior to purchasing it, as well as the fact that we, you know, for lack of better words, rebuilt the darn thing. I mean, you know, we sandblasted it, we repainted it, we put new leaf springs on it, we fixed one of the axles. I mean, we basically put, after we purchased it, we put another... Uh, what we paid for it back into it, which having said, you know, if I had to do it all over again, I'd contact Dan Loach and I'd buy a brand new trailer. I wouldn't even mess with <laughs> it, you know. I, but, you know, three years ago, that wasn't an option. For people now, right. when people ask me now, 
I'm not an advocate of reclaimed trailers at all. If you want to build, hey, if you want to build something that you're going to drive out to your 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 rural property and park, and you're going to stay in it, you know, two three weeks a year, go for it. But for full time living, just spend the extra money. You'll be happier for it. It's structured correctly for a tiny house. And I agree with you, Ryan. I think that foundation is the beginning of an oh my gosh, I can't believe I did this. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. Um, you know, buying that trailer, it, it, there's something that clicks uh, mentally for you, psychologically. Uh, you're like, holy crap, this is real. Like, I'm doing that. You know, a lot of us have dreamed about building a tiny house for many years. And uh, I know I had a moment when I bought mine that it was sitting on the, the property where I was going to build it. And I was just like, whoa. Yeah, I, it, it kind of just hit me. It was really um, kind of crazy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and kind of to your point about, you know, personally, are you, um, you know, you, you have to be comfortable with uh, your confidence and the, the consequences yep. uh, of whatever trailer you choose. Um, but I, I'd also go further than just you and your family. Um, frankly, the first tiny house that gets obliterated on a highway and kills somebody because your house wasn't properly anchored, um, you're going to be hurting the movement. And so I, I want people to understand that, um, you know, obviously we, we care for people's families and, and personal safety, uh, but there's also a bigger thing at risk here too of uh, the movement. You know, um, I really dread the day that a tiny house gets in a wreck or falls off a trailer or something like that. Uh, so, you know, people just please do consider those types of things, um, you know, and you're, you know, I, I think it all comes down to safety and that's kind of what we're getting back at uh, w- with our discussion here is that, you know, a lot of these codes that we, we've kind of discussed um, kind of adopting in tiny houses are really for people's safety. Um, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, and you know, it for anyone who's listening to this and thinks, "Oh, well, you know, Ryan is clearly concerned with with what's in his best interest. You know, he's got a solid house and he's just more concerned with the movement because that's, you know, what he's spending time doing." Folks, this is not a joke. Like this is not a joke. Whenever whenever you hear of an RV getting in a wreck on the interstate or something like that, it sends ripples through an industry that has been around since 1923. It's mm-hmm. not like all of a sudden people go, oh, well, these people are crazy. You know, this new fad, it's crazy. This is something that still happens to RVers on the road. So it's not like we're being picked on by any means. The safety of everyone around you when you choose to take your home in a mobile fashion has to be considered. It Absolutely. And that goes for the tow vehicle, that goes for the tongue, that goes for your safety in, in the tongue. It's all of that. It's all of that. And, and you know, I, I, as we have this conversation, I'm very curious. I would love to talk to uh, Shane Caverly and, and Carrie Caverly of Clothesline Tiny Homes about this because um, he's a huge safety guy. And uh, they took a lot of precaution when they built their, uh, their gooseneck tiny home in terms of towing it and they've towed it several times i'd be very interesting to to hear his thoughts on the subject because you know um and even you know logan and tammy um to hear about them because they've towed theirs like three times now it it is Mm -hmm. it's not something that i think should be taken lightly and and ryan that's what i hear you saying is that building a tiny house we are at a point now where building a tiny house is not just building a backyard shed and it just so happens it fits on a trailer and you roll it around. It's so cute and you feel so sustainable and eco-friendly and all that. We're talking about something that really could reshape the face of how our society dwells on this planet in the future, both economically Mm -hmm. and ecologically. And I think it's high time that enough of us say, okay, folks, if you want to build one of these, here's the proper steps. Here's what needs to happen. We're not just writing blogs because it's fun because we have no other hobbies. We're not just writing books because we have nothing else to do. We're not just having workshops. We're doing this to try and teach from our mistakes so that you don't make those mistakes. They're not there just to entertain you while you watch you know, someone 
famous like Deke stand up there and tell you how to build, you know, how to build a backyard uh, cabin or something of that nature. Am, am I on a tangent yet, guys? <laughs> no, no, I don't think you are at all. In fact, I think, you know, the the conversation about, you know, this isn't a backyard shed, it has to be attached to the trailer. You know, I've been to several events and, and workshops where people have suggested, oh, well, you know, I think I'll just buy, you know, to make it inexpensive, I'll just buy one of those Home Depot sheds and I'll attach it to a trailer. And that's a big concern. If you really think you can do that, you know, there's a lot of stuff that goes into making something roadworthy, and a, sh- and a Home Depot shed is not one of those things. Yeah. The Home Depot shed is meant to go on a flatbed trailer in a pack. It comes as a pack. Walls and plywood and that sort of stuff. You either put it together when it gets to your house, or you hire the Home Depot crew to put it together. It's not built with even the sheer strength to withhold 55 mile an hour winds going down the highway. It just isn't. I can almost guarantee you, because I've been inside of these things, unless the actual Amish work crew comes out and sets it up on your property, it does not have the structural integrity to withstand what I call North Carolina living, coastal living. If I put one of those Mm -hmm. in my backyard and we get 65, 70 mile an hour gusts, I expect to to lose at least the roof. Because they they don't have the straps, they don't have tie downs, they don't have you know any of the shear support and the cross support. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, the, the studs are like 20 inch on center, 24 inch on center, something like that. Um, you know, with very little uh, integrity within the building. So you know that's a concern too, folks. If you want to just pull one out to your house and, and put it on a slab and 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 bolt it in like that, or use a concrete nailer or something like that, that's one thing. But to just plop one on a trailer, throw a few you know a few butterfly uh, nuts on some bolts, some carriage bolts, and call it a day, man, I got news for you. I am not riding anywhere on the interstate near you. Right. Well, yeah, Andrew, I, I think you you hit on some good points. I think. You know, we're having this conversation not to scare people, not to, um, you know, discourage people. It's to really empower people to understand um, all the the, the nuances of building a tiny house Mm -hmm. and um, also to appreciate uh, that the the stresses that your house are going to experience, the the sheer forces um, that are going, you know, and the physics that are involved with a tiny house going down the road are really extreme, in fact. And not only are they just extreme, um, you know, just you towing down the road, but let's say that um, there's an accident in front of you and you have to swerve really Mm -hmm. big time. You know, when you have three tons behind you, um, swerving becomes a whole different ballgame. Oh, yeah. And and forces just magnets you know, magnify greatly. And, and so we don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to scare anyone with, uh, with all these uh, potentialities and, and horror stories and things like that. Um, but I, I think it's important that people appreciate uh, that there's safety concerns, yep. that there's engineering concerns, and that uh, there's a learning curve with some of these things. And, uh, you know, you have three experts right here uh, that are, are well versed in these types of things. Yeah. So, um, you know, we're a resource for you all. Um, we have our blogs, and I know we all um, kind of do coaching and things like that one on one with folks. Uh, so, you know, learn from our experiences, our, even in some cases, our mistakes, and, uh, you know, other people's information, things like that. There's a lot of info out there now. Um, And and I know I was talking with a couple other people who had built tiny houses, and they were just saying the the difference between when they built the tiny house, which was a couple years ago, and now um, is just night and day. There are so many more resources uh, Mm -hmm. for people out there to to really learn how to do these things. Yeah. Um, And and so I, I think... You know, tiny houses have come a long way, and we're just talking about the the next evolution of tiny houses. Absolutely, is to ensure safety and bring them into a, a legal, uh, you know, place that people can um, enjoy living in them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, and I agree with you. And and let me just put that on the record. I'm I'm not trying to use scare tactics, and I'm not at all discouraging people. In fact, what I'm saying is this is probably the most 
encouraging time to properly build a tiny home for yourself or your your family that there's ever been before. I mean, there's so much information out there that's affordable, that's accessible, that's reliable. The one thing I would caution you about is vet the people whose information you are consuming. You know, don't be afraid to send me an email or to send Ryan an email or send Laura an email and say, hey, you know, I read this blog post. I think it's really, really great. Could you tell me since the time you built the house, have you noticed anything that would, you know, render this post uh, maybe a little outdated or something like that? For instance, Mm -hmm. you know, I've answered several questions about a a product or two that we've used that has not necessarily performed the way I'd hoped it would or that I would say is better suited for something this size than that size. Vet the people. It's just like when you're looking for a doctor. You know, if a doctor's going to, you know, go down your throat with a with a Q-tip and swab all around there and make you hack up, you at least want to know that the person has some experience doing that. So, you know, don't be afraid to vet the people whose information you're taking. If you want to take a workshop from you know, one of the companies or, or from Deke or something like that, email them and say, hey, could you give me a, a little more specific detail? I'm really curious about X, Y, Z. Will you cover any of that in the workshop? I'm interested in going, but I just want to know if this will be covered. We have no problem doing that because if you're on the up and up, you believe so much in what you're doing that you will take the time to respond personally to people's inquiries. I, I can at least speak for myself. I will always take the time to, you know, to say this is why we did this or, or this is what we did or, you know, in the past six months, uh, you know, I realized that this could have been better, better suited or something like that. So I agree with you, Ryan. This is not a discouraging message. If anything, it's to let everyone listening that this is the most encouraging and most advantageous time to, to pursue this. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think back, like you said, about when we started, and we had pretty much one resource. And <laughs> we made use of it, but it was it was all that was available. And today there are so many people out there, reliable, good people that are doing this, uh, you know, built their own tiny houses or are doing business building tiny houses, that it's a perfect time to get, you know, the right information to move forward with your own project. Yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, look, I don't want to. I, I don't want to run out before uh, we have a chance to just mention. You know, it has been on the social media channels in the past day or two. Uh, Ryan, you seem to have finished a book that might be coming out soon. Is this correct? Uh, yeah, there's a book in the works. Um, I can't get into too many details yet uh, about it, but yes, there is a book coming. Um, a published book you'll you'll be able to find in stores coming April 2014. And um, also, I guess uh, a nice thing to, I thought I'd say to announce for on your channel here is that um, Cracking the Code is actually going to be releasing an update. Oh, wow. uh, Very soon. Yeah, so within a week, we're going to be doing an update. Um, So for the people who have already purchased the e-book, you're getting the update for free. So uh, look for that in your e- email box. You'll be getting an email with the, the update uh, for you to download right there. And then um, I hope that, you know, the people that are listening to this are willing or, you know, if they're interested uh, in the book, that uh, they'll they'll also be able to enjoy that, that update. And we're calling that our, our tiny house uh, toolkit. Cool. And basically what, it, what it's doing is uh, just opening up some of the – discussion on uh, the different avenues. Uh, when I wrote the ebook, I, I presented what I felt like was the, the best method uh, for pursuing uh, a tiny house from a legal standpoint and then also from an under-the-radar standpoint. Right. Um, so with this toolkit is basically um, giving you, let's see, I think there's 10 or 12 different uh, approaches uh, to pursuing your tiny house in a legal fashion. And then it breaks down those um, approaches with pros and cons uh, to each so that you can just better understand what what really uh, are the dynamics in play when you pursue a certain approach. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so that's going to be coming out in the next week or so. Uh, we're really excited about that. And um, again, for all of you who have already purchased it, we say thank you. And you'll be getting a free uh, update in your email soon. Very cool. Very cool. Um, there's just, there's a lot going on. I think it's great that all these resources are becoming available. Um, I, uh, I think, uh, we're about, we're about through with our time here for our interview today, but Ryan, as always, it's been great having you on the show. Um, I know that folks can find you, of course, on your website, um, which there is not, correct me if I'm wrong, to get to, um, to get to the book, it's just off of your website, right? It's not uh, It's not a separate URL, is it? Right. So you'll go to my main website, which is thetinylife.com, mm-hmm. and then on the main menu bar, there's a, a link to our store. Right. And there you'll find our um, Cracking the Code ebook, uh, which will be updated soon. And then uh, you'll also find um, you can purchase copies of the infographic, uh, that we did a while ago, and then we have a tiny house cheat sheet that I developed um, after realizing I kept on referring to this little scrap of cardboard uh, <laughs> that I kept in my bucket every single day when I was like, okay, I know that, that that decimal is like the equivalent of like something on my ruler, and so I would look and say, oh, that's like, you know, uh, a 30 second or something like that. Uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a dollar fifty, but um. I found it being really useful, and so I kind of developed it just because I was using this scrap of cardboard, and I was like, this is silly. I should, like, make this look nice, and so I went, and I, you know, made a nice-looking version of it, and I, I kept on bringing it, bringing it with me to my work site and using it all the time, and then I was like, you know, I bet this would be helpful for other people. So, yeah, we have the ebook, the infographic, and the little uh, cheat sheet awesome. um, for people there at the store. Awesome. I find that absolutely hilarious that you have one of those, and I think a lot of tiny house builders do. We had an actual scrap of two by four that we had yep. written all that same stuff out on. Yeah, there, there's a. I in my I, I usually bring a bucket to my work site, and uh, it has all my little tools in it. And there, I realized there was a couple like scraps of cardboard and a few pieces of two by four that I had like really key um, measurements written down on that were really important and if I had lost them it would have been like devastating so um, <laughs> I think that's a pretty common practice for tiny house folks and um, yeah the little cheat sheet kind of came out of that you know if I were any sort of computer guy I or, or telephony guy I would build an app for that and sell yeah, the yeah, app absolutely. but uh, I know nothing about that so and I'm not going to say it too loud because someone will do it and then I'll lose out on my fortune so I'm not talking about it but uh, so for those of you who d- who didn't catch that, of course it'll be in the uh, the blog post associated with this podcast. That's the tiny life t h e t i n y l i f e dot com. We're talking with Ryan Mitchell today, uh, mostly about uh, about zoning regulation codes that sort of stuff, and and about his book Cracking the Code, which is due for a, a an update in the next week or so. So please keep your eyes out for that. Ryan, thank you so much for being part of the show today. We certainly appreciate it. Uh, thank you, guys. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. All right, so Laura, that was uh, that was our buddy Ryan Mitchell, who, of course, you know, we didn't even mention it. Ryan's also one of the uh, one of the four original founders of uh, Tiny House NC, which, uh, of course, is our on again, off again pet project about tiny house living in the state of North Carolina. Um, so yep. we, we really lot... just wanted to work together because yeah. we had so much fun. Yeah, totally, totally. So. I'm, I really like his book. I mean, I, 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 you know, unfortunately it came along after it would have been super huge useful for me, but I've referred it to several people, and I think it became a useful tool for them, so I'm excited to see the updated version. And, you know, Ryan's kind of a, a mysterious guy anyway, so I'm excited to find out more about, uh, about his next book and what that's going to entail. Um, it's cool because I think his is maybe... Uh, I don't know, like the third book or something that I've heard about that's actually going to be published by a publisher and available in uh, in bookstores across the country. So that's very cool that, that tiny houses are moving in that direction. Um, Absolutely. It really kind of legitimizes the movement that we're not just a grassroots movement anymore. Yeah, it does. It certainly, certainly does. Um, 
So, yeah. Uh, so, that's a... You know, I, I don't understand these closings because he said it all. The interview said it all. I don't know what I could possibly add to it. Um, <laughs> I don't. I don't. Um, I, I can add this. I don't know what part of the country our listeners are in, but I'm about sick of this gloomy weather that is looming large over the state of North Carolina. Um, I could use some sunshine. It's starting to make me depressed, pre, pre-January pre depressed, even. Wow, that's that's pretty impressive for the South, so hopefully yeah. we'll get some sun back soon. Yeah, really, especially since I have some great pumpkin ales that were sent to me from Pennsylvania that require a fairly crisp, sunny autumn day to enjoy. So they're sitting there and waiting there, and- for it. And we finally talked about beer on this podcast. I was wondering when that would happen. Uh, as sure as my name is Andrew Odom, it's going to happen. <laughs> always, always. So look, Laura, we'll be back sometime. Uh, same time. Well, <laughs> I don't know why I would say same time. That's a ridiculous notion. Uh, we'll be back again with another episode of, uh, of the Revo Combo at some point. So people, keep your eyes open for our posts. Keep your ears open for our voices. And until then, have fun, be safe, build tiny.